So we, we interspersed music all in between and had a great time. I'm the luckiest guy in the world to ever go to. And schools all over, public, private, county, city, inner city, outer city, whatever you want to call it, is a one. I mean, 20 of them out of 100 that got to go. We were very fortunate to do that. And it's an incredible story. And I think we opened some eyes. The teachers really appreciate it. I know that because they could probably relate to it more. But when we got up to the 1960s, we talked about the civil rights movement here. The, it was the age of protest, the, the Oden Park Expressway issue. The first environmental victory in the country was Oden Park in the Expressway issue back in 1971. I'll cover that in a minute. So real quickly, I'll kind of give you a snapshot version of that PowerPoint. But it, uh, we started it out with Memphis, well, where are we? Uh, if you look on the, on the globe right here, you know, we're right in the center of the country. Uh, we're at the intersection of 35 and 90. That's 35 latitude, 90 longitude. That's 35 and 90 right down there in White Haven. Uh, in, a, in the continental America, we're halfway between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, with a highest piece of ground on the Mississippi River between Cairo and New Orleans, the first railroad to connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Mississippi River in the history of our country came from Charleston to Memphis. This railroad, y'all love this railroad track over here, don't you? Mm. Now that you got the bridge. It was the first railroad to connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Mississippi River, 1857. Yeah, wow, huh? <laughs> but at that time, most railroads were about 100 miles long. This was almost 800 miles long, so it was like going to the moon at the time in transportation. It was huge. You're riding a horse and buggy 10 miles an hour over the mountains and everything swamps. Now you can hear in two days, boom, right through here, right to downtown where the Wendy's is now. <laughs> Spur line to the river. The cobblestones got been laid, so we became a big transportation center based on rail and the river. You can't talk about Memphis unless you talk about the Mississippi River. Now on the map, there'll be a Big thing there, the Mississippi River drains 41% of continental North America. That's 31 states and two provinces of Canada. Everything between the Rockies and the Smokies comes through here at about eight miles an hour. Uh, about 330,000 gallons a minute. And every gallon of water has a teaspoon of mud in it. It's a muddy Mississippi. That ooze is laid out over the years to make the Delta the flattest place on the earth and all that rich soil for hardwood trees and then cotton and now rice. Uh, we were the 18th, 19th century, we had 400 sawmills in this area with the hardwood capital of the world. Between 1880 and 1930, 70% of the cotton crop in America is within 200 miles of Memphis. So we're the cotton capital of the world, we're the mule capital of the world. Uh, right now, between Memphis and Little Rock, 45% of the rice crop grows in America. Between Memphis and Little Rock, big rice country right there. You know, so it's always been agriculture. Memphis was in the center of all this, 150 mile radius over the years. Uh, we got a French fort in the 17th, 19, uh, 18th century, a Spanish fort in the 19th century. Memphis got laid out in 1819. Uh, let's see, 1796, let's start. 1796, Tennessee becomes the 16th state to join the Union. Uh, 18, oh, uh, let's see, 1811, 1812, big earthquake. Our bluff was formed by earthquake in the 6th century. This earthquake kind of reshaped the Arkansas lands. The pneumatic earthquake that's about 200 miles north of us. That was 200 years ago, or 90 miles north of us. Uh, 1819, Memphis gets laid out. Basically, the area between the Pyramid and the Peabody and St. Jude, just that little small area, 1,300 acres. And uh, you get on up uh, through the 1800s uh, into uh, the Wolf Folkman's War. You get into the train comes through, and then now it comes time for the Civil War. And the Union strategy in the Civil War, believe it or not, was get control of the Western Rivers. Because you control the rivers, the Tennessee, the Cumberland, the Mississippi, you control the troop and supply movement and all the goods. Memphis was a huge port here with the rail and the cobblestones. So in June 6, 1862, 5,000 citizens came out and sat on the banks of the Mississippi River and watched the naval battle of Memphis in the river like it was an NFL football game. They're just shooting each other in the river, not, on, not shooting anybody on the land. And they watched it. The battle lasted 90 minutes because the Union had three times the boats and gunpowder than the Confederacy did. But it was the largest inland naval battle in the history of the world. Memphis, Tennessee, June 6, 1860, were quickly a northern occupied town, the most strategic northern occupied town there was. You probably hadn't heard the story about Memphis in the Civil War. We were a hospital town. We housed over 7,000 wounded units. So we were a sanctuary city. We didn't have that term 150 years ago. We were a sanctuary city for free slaves, runaway slaves, colored troops, all in Memphis, over 20,000. We doubled our population during the Civil War. Most cities in the South were losing population. Atlanta, Montgomery, 
Richmond getting burned, you see. The Fifth Southern Marshal Law for three years. General Sherman came to march to the sea. General Grant played part of the Vicksburg from Huntington, homeless to the stands, hospital of town. Business was so good in Memphis that first Tennessee bank actually opened in Memphis, its first national bank in 1864, because business was so good. It's the 14th oldest bank charter in America. That's us in the Civil War. Civil War's over with. We're a fast growing city. Peabody Hotel gets built. And what the Civil War couldn't do to Memphis, the mosquitoes did. We said in 1870, we said a series of three years of yellow fever epidemics. By 1878, uh, we lost 5,000 citizens in one summer. In, in two months, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 5,000 citizens for the whole time. Uh, at one summer, we started out with 40,000 citizens, 25,000 left. Of the 15,000 left behind, 5,000 died. So we lost three fourths of our population in one month. Went into bankruptcy for 14 years as a city. You know, and then we gradually decided somebody came and thought sanitary sewers would help, even though it was a mosquito, but it was the bad health condition. We started cleaning up our city. Right after the Civil War II of 1865, the quickest way to get Union soldiers back up north was by boat, not by land. And one boat called the Sultana. Have you heard of the Sultana? Yeah. Have you heard of the Titanic? Everybody's heard of the Titanic. Well, Leonard DiCaprio was on the Titanic. Right? Okay. But uh, this boat was certificated with 376 passengers, went down the river, gathered passengers in Vicksburg and matches. And by the time it got to Memphis, there was over 2,300 passengers on the boat, six times its legal limit. One stove for a seven day trip and 100 horses. How's like being in this room with 200 more people? A couple of horses over here by Mr. Rowan. No microwave or nothing, no water. I mean, it was terrible conditions. The boat was overcrowded. Went up river, the borders blew seven miles out of Memphis. Bodies flowed by Memphis today, so over 1,700 people lost their life. The largest maritime disaster in the history of our country, 1865. So the largest in the Navy battle, the railroad, 1857, this, and then the yellow fever epidemic of 1878 was the largest single loss of life for any event in the history of our country. 5,000 people died. That's larger than the Johnstown flood, the San Francisco earthquake, and the Chicago fire put together. This is what we've gone through. And through all this disaster, we built a hospital reputation that became a tough, gritty city, uh, like I say, sanctuary city, a melting pot, uh, in migration from the Delta, immigration from Europe in the 1890s, the Jewish, the Italian, the, the uh, German, <clears throat> The Irish came into town. Uh, 1900 comes here. W.C. Handy comes up the Delta, the Blues Highway, they say, into Bill Street. You took the field hollers, the work songs, the spirituals that became country, gospel, and blues, came into Bill Street where blacks and whites could go together. In the early 1900s, Lieutenant George W. Lee, who has a street name for him downtown, had a quote saying that Bill Street is a mile of vice and commercial ambition known by the Jews, but it's by the whites, and enjoyed by the Jews. Negro was a term at the time for what we, I guess we call black male or African American. But back at that time, uh, there's, a, there's a race exhibit at Pink Palace and had a kid, a black face kid here, a kid with a t-shirt with his black face on right here, and had 1900 colored, and it had, I don't know, it had Negro, then by 1930s or 40s he was colored, then he was black, now it's African American. It's the same person, but the way we talk about, you know, we say Native American now, but Indian, you know, we're talking like we say Caucasian and white, I guess. but. That just explains how the things were at that time. It was a segregated city. Blacks couldn't go up into the main part of town. Whites could go down to Bill Street at certain times, uh, and they would go down there because it was in the 20s and 30s and 40s, we were the, probably the most uh, dangerous city in America, criminal-wise, cocaine, prostitution, graft, vice, everything. When you read the books about it, it's incredible how the city stayed together. Uh, but W.C. Handy, uh, got here in the early 1900s, and in 1909, uh, a man by Mr. Crump, Ed Crump ran from there. He wrote a, uh, a song called Mr. Crump, and he got permission three years later to name it Memphis Blues. It's the first blues song ever published in the history of our country. Published from Fourth and Beale right there at Pace and Handy Music Company, Memphis Blues, you know. Uh, you fast forward up to 1916, Clarence Saunders. Think about this. He thought it'd be a good idea to let you walk through the grocery store aisles and pick out your own groceries. And that a good idea before that time, you had to get your list, you'd come and put it in the cart right here. They would go back and get your groceries and bring it back to you. You would give them the money, you get your things and you leave. So he had a turnstile put up and we opened the first self-service grocery store in America here in 1916 at Jefferson. Make Piggly Weekly, okay? That was what it was. In 1880s, a man by the name of uh, Baron Collier, 
he dropped out of high school, Market Street School, he went to work for the railroads, then he got a contract putting uh, the gas in the gas lamps around town as a teenager, then he bought a print company, and the streetcars came to Memphis, so he started making these 11 inch by 21 inch ads. If you've been in a streetcar, he got the ads inside there where you're standing up and looking at the ads. He became the father of streetcar advertising, went to Chicago to New York, had 70 cities and 35 states and 20 million viewers a year by the 1920s. The father of streetcar advertising. He bought land in New York for Luna Park next to Coney Island. He bought all the land down in Florida, a lot of Everglades land. It became Collier County. That's the Everglades National Park. He's one of the founders of Boy Scouts, one of the founders of Interpol. And he was the guy in my life that's most important out of all these things he did. He's the one that thought of, of the yellow lines and the white lines on the highway. Somebody had to do that, right? Think about it. Before we started getting cars, in 1904, we had eight automobiles in Memphis, and the speed limit was 8 miles an hour. By 1910, we had 1,000. By 1920, we had 19,000. By 1930, 32,000. So we went automobile crazy. See, we had to pave streets and put lines down and knock people, knock people honk horns and have stoplights and police at intersections, stop signs. Somebody invented the stop sign. Stuff we take for granted. One of Mickey, but Mickey did invent the yellow line and the white lines. Yeah. My hero, Barry Collier, right? Uh, get up through the 1920s. I'm rambling here. Let's go to the 1930s. Look at all the jazz, the blues. Uh, 1948, uh, we uh, developed or created the first all black formatted radio station in the world, WBIA. Uh, it's down over here by Open Square. Rufus Thomas and B.B. King were two of the first DJs there. Rufus really helped beat me. I got to meet Rufus and do a lot of things with Rufus in the Rock and Soul Museum. <coughs> 1950. Sam Phillips, now 